Hi, I've decided that um, I want to talk about a community that I used to live in. And um, I'm doing that on the back of a community that I'm in right now, where I'm always saying to people, um, and saying to myself too, and I'm always saying to people that what we're trying to do is constantly balance two principles that seem to be opposites, individual and community. You know, we want to be fully expressive, each of us, no matter who we are, and we want to be cooperative with one another. And you could say that's really the hope for the world. How can we be individuals and be in common as well? And that is what we're always working with at some level. Now, in America, the choice has always been individualism. You see it in the way um, the suburbs are built, for example, where it's like one house after another, each one has its own special property, and often neighbors don't even know each other. They just, they, each one stays in their own house, they have their own friends. Once in a while they'll say hi across the fence, there's usually big fences. And um, community is not as important in America as it is in some other places in the world. Um, and that has really, it's interesting when you see the incredible uh, initiative that people take in this country, much more so than in many countries, because of that phenomenal emphasis on the individual. So I have nothing against the individual. I just also say let's do community as well. So I want to talk about a community that I used to live in. I'm, I've been very much focused on living in community probably all my life, even though there have been a few times I've lived alone. But I'm always fascinated by um, how groups operate with each other. Um, I'm fascinated by the rules, the unstated rules, the stated rules that people use when they're working together or not working together. And um, this community that I want to talk about today is one that was extremely individualistic. Um, I mean, to a fault, really, because they didn't have a balance. They weren't even thinking that way, of course. Most people aren't. Most people don't think about contradictions as paradoxes. They don't think about the fact that the opposite of one great truth, as Niels Bohr said, is always another great truth. And we want to learn how to inhabit the space between the polarities, whatever these polarities are. So this polarity of individual and community is the one that is probably the dominant one that I've been trying to learn from and with in my whole lifetime. And I would say that the one I'm in now, this Green Acres Village, is probably the most successful in terms of dynamically balancing these opposites. And it may be because I've learned more since then about what that means. I've learned that that is exactly what I'm about in terms of this lifetime. And uh, so I can be much more conscious in putting that across to myself and to other people. Okay, so this community, it still exists, the one I'm talking about. So that's odd. Usually individualistic communities don't keep going. You know, usually they're, they're like a bunch of anarchists get together in a house and then they break up after a year or two or less. But this one is still going, though of course the individuals have changed over the years. And so I want to talk about when I came into that individual, that, that community and what it was like when I arrived and who I was then and then how it changed during the time I was there. I want to look at it both culturally and politically, the internal politics of the place, which were fascinating also. And what I learned as a result of being there um, is, you know, profound. Okay, I was in Jackson Hole, uh, Wyoming. I had come a few years earlier and I was going to do a peace activist magazine which I did and I actually had a community there too in this place called Heartland House which was very much focused on this project but the people in the house were fighting each other a lot and mainly we were fighting other communities or other groups of people that were also working on quote peace unquote so I was I realized at the time a violent peace activist and um, that shocked me to realize that. And um, then I was going to leave town. And I went into the, to the library one day or to the bookstore one day and I told this friend of mine that I was leaving town. And she said, well, do you want to move into the yurts? And I said, geez, I don't know, maybe tell me. So she said, well, there's this yurt available right now. And I said, oh, okay. So 
I moved in. And the year I was in, um, I, I lived in several different yurts over the years. This year it was 20 feet diameter, most of them are. And it was, I think it's 330 square feet total, 20 feet diameter, that's what that amounts to. And uh, instantly I loved it. I just love living in a structure that is round, that is that only has a skin separating me from the earth, from the, from the environment around me, where the ravens as they're flying by, you can actually hear their wings, where the moon is visible in the night sky because it comes through translucently through the walls of the yurt. Um, the, you could hear the wind, you could, you could feel, you could hear the rain as it pattered on the roof. All, every, it was like living in a tent in a sense, except much more luxurious because it was 20 feet in diameter and plenty tall enough to move around in. Okay, so there I was. Now, interestingly enough, I had moved in and I didn't know anything about the people that were there except that she was there, my friend, uh, Lynn was there. And uh, she happened to have uh, a sister who was married to someone and then there's another guy. And those three, it turns out, I found out over time actually were the people that were inviting people into the yurts. They had invited Lynn because she was a much more um, public person than her sister. And these three were actually in a spiritual group that I still don't understand, where the leader of it was in Montana. And they wanted to get a spiritual community together. Now, Lynn herself is very much um, a creative person, and so she invited her friends, who are all weird artistic types, um, very anarchistic, but really allowing each other space and so forth. So we were all there. There were a bunch of us that came, that, but all thought that we were there uh, in the same way that, that she was, which, you know, she's an uh, individual, and she was very artistic and so forth, very expressive, very creative. But then there is the other three that actually one of them lived there, but the rest of them didn't. And but then we kept feeling like, hmm, this it's not what it seems. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but it's not what it seems. Uh, but we we still pressed on. And then so we started to do these um, events for the public. Um, uh, for example, a the, the one that was really important was um, solstice events that we were doing. Uh, downtown and we'd have um, different people go on stage and uh, do different things. One woman did a Tai Chi performance, I did an astrology presentation, um, another guy that lived there is a real great storyteller. So it was a wonderful thing that we had planned. We did it one year and then the next year we found out that um, one of the three said that, that we really needed permission to do it and we went, what? Yeah, we needed permission to do, permission from who, for why. So that's when we started to find out what was going on behind the scenes. That there was, that they had a, a goal in mind that uh, they were going to create a spiritual community. We were the people that were supposed to be in their spiritual community. Um, the sister was, was kind of embarrassed by that. She didn't, she wasn't really into that, but she was loyal to her sister. So she was kind of in between the two. And it ended up with them telling us, well, we said, to, to heck with it, you know, we're going to go through with our performance. But afterwards, it's like, then there was a bullet. We all shared yurts. So each one had a yurt. There was 10 yurts, 10 living yurts. And we'll put this up with a couple of pictures to show what that was. And it still is, actually. But 10 living yurts and... Um, there was uh, a single bathhouse. It used to be a KOA camp. So we had taken over a KOA camp. And so we, we, we had to cooperate, uh, at least to the extent of how does the bath, bathhouse work and the parking lot, those two things. Like the bathhouse, everybody had a cubby hole in the, in the shower room. Um, you're supposed to wash your dishes. You, you had to do dishes in the bathhouse because nobody had running water in their yurt. So we slept the dishes to the bathhouse and back again. Uh, we had to cooperate in the parking lot in terms of, you know, paying for it when the person had to come to plow when it, when it was a deep winter. Um, certain things happened that, that put us at odds with one another, but usually managed to work it out. But 
the point is that it was, it was cooperation only when necessary. And those two things were absolutely necessary because those were what we actually held in common, even though we were all just renting the place. There was no ownership there. Everybody was renting. And the lease was held by those three people. Okay, so one day I walk into the bathhouse and there's a, uh, a piece of paper on the bulletin board and it said that each of us is supposed to sign up to be interviewed. What? You know, we were supposed to be interviewed by the other three. And so everybody dutifully signed up. This kind of reminds me of the masks now. And I went, why? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sign up to be interviewed. And to see whether we are actually appropriate for the place was the, 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 was, I think that's how they said it. So everybody did it. And so they had these interviews. And I was like, each time I couldn't believe they all did it. I didn't do it. But it ended up that didn't go anywhere. Um, we were all still there afterwards, even though we had we had to kind of like, what do you call it, uh, deprogram the person after they came back from their from their meeting with the three because it was just really weird how they somehow put them into some kind of state, mental state that you know we realized when they'd come back we had to let them let them out of there. And we did. But the meetings continued, and every time you'd walk into the, one of the meetings that had to do with the whole group, you could, uh, I noticed this incredible tension ring. It was like this. You walk in the, the door, and it's like, oh, you were inside a tension ring, and you couldn't be yourself. You couldn't be an individual. And you call that a group, I'd call that prison. It was like a mental prison. You'd walk into a mental prison for at least that hour. And then you could walk out again. It was just really weird. And then there was the the sister um, wanted to have a meeting with all of us again. So this time, okay, we'll have the meeting. Now I happened to go to the library that day, and I I for the first time found out about the Iroquois Nation, which had a uh, three parts to it, three different parts, just like the United States does now. As a matter of fact, we took those three parts, those three, the executive, the legislative, and the, and the um, judicial aspects of our government from the Iroquois Nation. What we did not take, however, was the Elder Council. <laughs> That's what we should have had too. A council of elders that you know, was really in charge, ultimately. We didn't have that, and I was blown away by by the parallel between them and by the fact that we'd actually taken that from the Native Americans when we when we created our government. And I told one of the people, one of our, us, in, about that. And so when this this tension ring formed that day, um, and we were just sitting there in silence, kind of like. Ugh. And so the guy I told, I, I said, why don't you tell us what, what happened today when you were at the library, Anne? And so I launched into this. I have no idea what I said, but it went on for like half an hour. I just said, well, it wasn't like what we're doing here. And I just went on and on and on, apparently. And then I said, and furthermore, I'm done with this place. I'm leaving. So I got up and walked out. And I thought, golly, I've done this before. You know, I can't stand something. Other people seem to be able to stand it, and I'm just out of here. And I felt really lonely at the time. It's like, ugh. So then, so it was okay. Tomorrow I'm leaving. And that morning, that next morning, I get up and go, go to the bathhouse to do my dishes. And this same guy comes in and said jokes like, hey, well, <laughs> you still leaving? I said, yep. And he said, well, I'll, I'm right behind you. And so it ended up that I led, I, you know, just by my action of wanting to take charge of my own life and not be under somebody's thumb, which I didn't even know I was supposed to be under until I moved there, led to this exodus from the yurts. Now, then the yurts stayed there, kind of dormant. One person was in the yurt, in one of the yurts, for a couple of years, he would have to get the snow off every one of the yurts. You know, he, they, it was dormant for a couple of years. I don't know how they paid the rent. Maybe they didn't make them pay the rent. The, the, the 
the land itself is worth millions. This is in the Tetons um, in, uh, in Wyoming. It's right across from the Grand Teton in the village of Kelly. And uh, then we started drifting back because the original three were gone. And then we had a whole different and a whole different set of people there. I mean, there were some of us that were the, the same ones, but it was much freer. It was much freer. We didn't have that holding up over our heads, that so-called spiritual community holding over our heads anymore. But on the other hand, gradually, there was a power, power politics developed within the group as to who ruled. It was still very individualistic that way, that it was still power wanting to be taken. And I'm, I was one of them, really, I was. And it ended up being the, a power struggle between two people, me and another woman. And I, but I, by that time, was aware enough of my own shadow that I knew that that meant that she was a projection from me of a part of myself that I didn't like and that that was the conflict. The conflict was between me and a part of myself that I had projected onto her. So I had to take back the projection. I knew that was the work. And so I, I worked on that. I worked on it internally for a whole year. I worked on it internally for a whole year. Every time that I would walk by the yurt where she lived, I would freeze up. And that's how I knew that I was still completely, you know, completely bound up in this projection onto her. Until one day, I noticed that when I walked by her yurt, I didn't feel it anymore. It's like, what happened? Have I actually done it? Have I actually let go of all the tendrils that were holding me in, in this vice grip of projection? Have I done it? I said to my friend, who was very aware of what I was going through, I said to her, I think maybe I've let it go. You know, we took a walk every morning, and she and I, and I said, you know, I think that I've let it go. I don't think I feel that way anymore. And she really, she said, yeah. And so I walked back by her yurt on my way to my yurt. Didn't feel it. Gosh, I thought, wow, this is great. I've actually managed to clear a projection. And you know, that very night, she and her husband packed up and left. They left the yurt park without saying that they were leaving even. All of a sudden, they were gone. As soon as I had let go of the projection, they had let go of the place. And I'll never forget that, how when we, when we do our own work, when we do our own internal work, our internal shadow work, which has to do always with either denial of a part of ourselves or the, deny, the denial is projected onto another, then the world changes. And it did. And, um, you know, the yurts, I was still there for a few more years, but that was the great lesson for me. That was the great learning for me. And um, then my husband, Jeff, came to town and he was there with me for a long time. He loved living in yurts. And then we both moved here to, um, to Indiana because he wanted to go to law school. And that was the beginning of this place, which I didn't know I was going to do then. But five or six years later, I began to do by taking the permaculture course, which led to everything else. So that's, I just wanted to tell you that the, the, the culture and the politics of something are, are, are probably inextric inextricably combined uh, and if individualism is stressed, then there's probably going to be conflict between the individuals eventually. Um, I remember uh, when I was in seventh grade, I did a, I did a, um, a uh, book, book report uh, for, for this class in seventh grade. And I, wrote, I read a book on prisoners of war and it profoundly affected me, um, just the suffering that they went through. And um, I forgot about it, except that I remember I wrote a paragraph um, introducing my review that was um, something that flew out of me that I didn't even understand. But my mother found it 
and she found it to the day that I started writing my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, which I'm now retyping after 50 years, which is a profound document. And the reason it was interesting that she found it that day was that dissertation had, I had finally, the writing of it had begun, and the first paragraph of the dissertation had the same tone, cadence, rhythm of that paragraph that I wrote in seventh grade. And this is what that paragraph said. It was one sentence. Since the world is made up of individuals, there will always be competing ideas, ideas which usually down through the ages have usually resulted in one thing, colon, war. So that's the story of my experience of the Yurts. Thanks.